This video was made possible by Morning Brew. Start your day catching up on what's happening in business, finance, and tech by signing up for their free daily newsletter at the link in the description. In our lifetimes, the dominant story of economic explosion has been that of China. Previously, it was a poor, vast, peripheral country. In mere decades, though, its growth has pulled it to center stage, and the country now plays a serious role in world affairs. With the core of that transformation now behind us, however, many have asked the question, who's next? Which corner of the world is set for a similar dramatic rise in the coming years? Plenty of candidates come up, but one of the most frequently floated names is Africa. It's a continent with a huge population, but a generally lower level of economic development. It's a region that often, in many ways, falls behind, but that means the only direction to go is up. So is the African continent poised to become the next China, the next darling of the world economy? Africa is a sprawling continent three times the size of Europe, composed of 54 countries, 1.4 billion people, and countless religions, languages, ethnic groups, and cultures. Many appropriately criticize media when they overzealously refer to the continent as one, generalizing what's happening in part of the continent to its entirety, but there is logic and precedent for examining Africa as a cohesive unit from an economic lens, at least. For the purposes of simplicity, economists and journalists often group related countries together into business regions. For example, often, economists will look at the European economy as a whole since France's economy, for example, is deeply interwoven with Germany's, so their fates are essentially tied. Meanwhile, they'll often look at China by itself since it's large enough to be analogous to Europe, but also unique and isolated enough economically that grouping it with Japan, for example, would not be appropriate. Japan can prosper when China does not, and vice versa. That's why China is worth examining on its own, while Africa is examined as a whole. The countries that compose the continent are economically interlinked and add up to a population comparable to China's. Therefore, in this context, one could expect that the development potential of Africa could be roughly akin to that of China. But we can quantify this. The African continent's current gross domestic product is $2.69 trillion. China's GDP in 2006 was, inflation-adjusted, $2.89 trillion, meaning the African economy today is roughly analogous to that of 2006 China. This is backed up by the fact that Africa's GDP per capita is currently $2,030, while 2006 China's was $2,100. Africa's urbanization rate is roughly equal to China's in 2008, while their foreign direct investment inflows are about the same as China's in 1992. All around, these four important economic development indicators suggest that Africa stands roughly 20 years behind today's China. Now, it would be staggering if this were the case, if in a mere two decades the African economy would be as relevant as China's today. Of course, some would have said the same about China decades ago, but economic indicators are often, counterintuitively, not the most helpful in determining economic growth prospects. China did not grow off of natural resources. So too, Africa is not likely to grow off of natural resources. Both have extensive resources, but economists have observed a phenomenon globally that they refer to as the resource curse. Essentially, an abundance of natural resources does not regularly translate well into sustainable economic growth. The reasons behind this are hotly contested and quite complex, but one of the simpler contributing factors is the tendency of resource-based economies to concentrate wealth to a select few. While a diamond mine owner might grow rich, the workers in the mine aren't learning any skills that they can use to innovate, start their own business, and grow the economy. They just aren't getting educated, and there's no direct incentive on a national level to improve formal education since the money that's being made is through jobs that do not require a high level of education. In the case of China, manufacturing, which was a major driving force behind its development, gave many the skills needed to start their own businesses, and there is now a significant homegrown tech sector in China that's helping to carry its economy beyond manufacturing. So, if Africa's going to have a China-style economic explosion, it's going to be because of human capital rather than natural resources. However, that's where the story gets less optimistic. One relevant demographic indicator is the dependency ratio. 
That's a number calculated by dividing the population 14 and under or 65 and over by the population between those ages. While it's not perfect, it's a rough index of how many people each working person in an economy has to support, either directly or through welfare systems. Now, in general, lower dependency ratios are better for an economy. Having less people to support and a greater percent of people working is financially beneficial, and correspondently, most developed economies have low dependency ratios. The US, for example, has a dependency ratio of 54%, indicating that for every 10 working age people, there are 5.4 dependents. Africa's, meanwhile, is 79%, far higher, largely due to the large youth population in many of the continent's countries. That puts this metric closest to China's in 1974, before their dependency ratio plummeted in step with falling birth rates as the country started to encourage then mandate one child per couple. So this demographic indicator is, relative to China's, far behind chronologically compared to the earlier economic indicators. But as important as the current state of the dependency ratio is to an economy, a stronger predictor of the future is the trend. Is the ratio rising, falling, or staying the same? The answer for Africa is easy. Continent-wide, the average in 1990 was 93%, compared to today's 79%. Their dependency ratio is falling, but this is like the 2D view of this demographic shift. What's even more useful is the 3D view, the population pyramid. These graphs are simple. Each row represents a 5-year age bracket, with the left side indicating the size of the male population in that bracket, and the right side the female population. Africa's pyramid indicates that the continent has a disproportionately young population, which is common for less developed regions. Meanwhile, Europe's population pyramid, like those of many more developed regions, indicates that its population is disproportionately middle-aged as it ages and birth rates decline. Now, China's pyramid is undoubtedly affected by the impact of its one-child policy, but looking at its progression since 1950, it demonstrates a powerful phenomenon. Through the 50s and 60s, birth rates are higher, meaning a large youth population arises. Then, starting in the 70s, birth rates decline, but the large youth population is still alive and moves into working age. This population bubble moves up the pyramid, creating a situation where there is a huge working age population and very few youth or seniors that this population has to support. By 2010, this pushed China's dependency ratio down to just 36%, almost unprecedentedly low for a large economy. In fact, today, the only countries with a lower dependency ratio are small nations like Qatar, the UAE, or Singapore, which have high immigrant labor populations that grow up and retire in their home countries, thereby skewing the statistics. Now, China's dependency ratio has since creeped up to 42% as this bulging population from the 50s and 60s has started to move into retirement age, becoming dependents once again, but the time period with the lowest dependency ratio corresponds well with the period in which the country experienced the most dramatic economic growth. One study found that China can attribute 9.2% of its economic growth between 1960 and 2000 to this bulge in the working age population. That's a small percent in isolation, but in the context of the complexities of national development, massive. At the simplest level, people and the government could invest money into growth rather than social support for the young and old, which helped accelerate development. The economic boost that ensues from this short-term population bulge has a name. It's called the demographic dividend. Estimates indicate a demographic dividend is coming for Africa as its birth rates decline, but potentially one less pronounced than China's. Current population projections would put Africa's 2050 dependency ratio at 60.7%, certainly a significant improvement from today's 79%, but a far cry from China's 36% low point. In fact, that dependency ratio is higher than today's world average, which sits at 54.5%. The future is not, however, set in stone. Now, the demographic dividend typically isn't, as some might speculate, a byproduct of development itself. It's well established that birth rates fall in step with development, but recent research suggests that the strongest trigger for a demographic dividend is, in fact, education. Women have fewer children when they are better educated. Currently, Africa's average secondary school enrollment by women as a proportion of total female population of secondary school age is 48.56%.
China first attained that level in 1977, before it briefly dipped as a result of the abandonment of Cultural Revolution-era education policies. Now, of course, improved education often comes with development, meaning the three factors work in cycle. Better education leads to a lower dependency ratio, which leads to faster development, which leads to better education, and so on and so forth. Beyond the dividend, Africa's current demographic status relative to China's can be further corroborated. For example, the continent's average fertility rate is closest to China's in 1974, its life expectancy parallels China's in 1976, infant fatality rate 1981, and literacy rate 1982. Looking at this timeline, with the addition of the earlier economic indicators, two defined clusters appear. The demographic indicators and the economic indicators. Economically, Africa's in the 2000s. Demographically, it's in the 70s. Of course there's a big wide world of chance and circumstance out there that can get in the way, and this is a narrow way of analyzing economic prospects in the first place, but this narrow method does present two primary conclusions. First, Africa is primed for development. In all quantifiable ways, the continent is in a similar or better position than when China began its period of explosive growth in the 70s and 80s. This isn't to say the growth will inevitably happen, but it is to say that there's nothing in the indexes that suggests that the continent, on average, isn't ready or capable of starting that growth. In fact, there's everything to suggest that Africa is in the exact right situation for a similar manner of growth to start. However, secondly, the gap between economic and demographic indicators should raise red flags. It suggests that what's holding growth back, if anything, is not the economic situation of Africa. It's the state of the population. The indexes are, in aggregate, headed in the right direction, but if African countries want to reap the explosive growth benefits of a demographic dividend, they have to concentrate on measures to improve family planning, keep more young girls in school, and bring more women into the workforce. As much as these measures might seem like one's done because it's the right thing to do, because improving gender equity is a positive for a country's international image, the demographic dividend proves that they cause tangible, significant economic effects downstream. Going back to this cycle, better education causing lower dependency ratios causing faster development, what is the easiest phase in the cycle to affect? A country can't just speed up development by itself. That's the end goal, but not a factor that a country can directly manipulate. Dependency ratios are easier for a country to affect, but measures like China's one-child policy are viewed as draconian and often difficult to implement. Voluntary family planning programs have seen success in certain countries, but are undoubtedly complex. The easiest phase in this cycle to manipulate is education, because, by its very nature, it's something that the country's government manages. The demographic dividend isn't some silver bullet for explosive development. Rather, it's one small yet powerful example of the merits of investing in people. It's an example backing up the suggestion that Africa's economies should not be focusing all their attention on using foreign direct investment inflows by courting superpowers for development projects, for example. That's important, but so is just getting kids in school, getting households hooked up to electricity, getting people to participate in elections. Improving people's quality of life matters far beyond just quality of life. So, is Africa the next China? Well, probably not. Despite the parallels, China is made up of one country. Africa, 54. China got things right once. Africa is unlikely to get things right 54 times. The data suggests that in aggregate the conditions are ripe for development, but there's still work to do. Some countries will put in that work and trigger a gold rush, while others will not. The others will eventually realize their fault and start to catch up, but this means that the fate of the continent will likely become less and less intertwined. By century's end, certain African economies will almost certainly be talked about the way China is discussed today, but the disconnected nature of the development process will likely mean that the global impact of this transformation will be less intense. That being said, the conditions are there, and the time is right. By recognizing their shortcomings and focusing on human development, Africa might not be the next China, but African countries just might be.
If you've sat through all that talk of indexes and demographics and development, you clearly enjoy learning about how the world works. I obviously do too, and one way I do that is to start my day not by browsing Twitter or TikTok, but by reading through Morning Brew's free daily newsletter. It always arrives in my inbox before I wake up and catches me up to speed on the most relevant stories in business, finance, and tech in a witty, informative style that's far more readable than traditional news. For example, this morning I was reading about the Democratic Party's proposed billionaires tax, why college enrollment is falling in the US, and how 3D printed houses could be a solution to the construction industry's labor shortage. Following the news consistently is just about the best way to become better informed, and Morning Brew just makes it so easy, especially considering their newsletter is free. Seriously, it's not a free trial, not a discount, just a free newsletter, so give Morning Brew a shot by clicking the button on screen or heading to the link in the description, and you'll be helping support Wendover while you're at it.